In Kilauea, uh, last week when we went on the road to um, to go to uh, we take it there, to go to uh, Spartanburg, we managed to get the last. We were able to get some of our book from this image. I just had like thirty-five books left, so we're trying to sort that out. And actually, we're trying to get out of that contract, and so we can redo everything and go a different avenue. Amen. So you can pray for us because I don't know the legal ramifications. We had some complications there long ago. And, but I want to say we did get some copies. So we sold some of them on the road. This is a book I wrote like 10 years ago, back in like 2000, called Think Like God. And I think Kayla has some copies. It cost us, we had to pay like a lot more for them through Destiny. Hello? You can turn me down a little bit. All right. Amen. We had to pay a lot more uh, for the book, so we were selling them for about $20 a piece on the road, but if you want a copy, you can get one for like uh, $15. I told Kayla, so if you'd like to get one, it was just a, I was just sharing with Kayla this one little page in it. The, the Bible teaches us that offense will come our way. If it does not give us the right to be offended, many times in the gospel, Jesus warns against offense. When we are corrected by our leaders, we have to realize that if we are not corrected, we will not grow. If you are struggling with offense, the first thing to do is to be quiet. Do not open your mouth because offense has the ability to breed. Not only will you be listening to the lies of offense, but you will be sowing those lies into another person. This will develop a critical spirit, not only in you, but in another. Before you know it, there will be judgment, anger, rottenness, gossip, and bitterness. I wrote, and your offense grows into a critical spirit. And a critical spirit breeds judgment. Judgment's roots go deep and produce bitterness. It is very common that when we are offended, we will gather around other people who are offended in order to protect our offense. Every believer needs to realize that when you share an offense, you are opening a doorway for sickness and disease to enter another person's life. The Bible makes it very clear that offense is outside of covenant. Offense lies in the, at the threshold of covenant. When you walk in offense, you are crossing the threshold and leaving the covenant behind. When you step out of covenant, you become a target for the enemy. It is as if you are saying, go ahead, devil, hit me. That's why the Bible teaches us to guard our hearts. The enemy is looking for a doorway to attack Christians. Satan is not only out to steal your strength, your boldness, your positive attitude, your prayer life. Satan is out to steal your joy because he, know, he knows that the joy of the Lord is your strength. He knows that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If he can get your joy, he has already destroyed your strength. Remember, offense, bitterness, and criticism all start in the thoughts. That must be cast down and taken captive. Bitterness, anxiety, and worry all go against the knowledge of God. These thoughts go against the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. There's just a little segment, just an offense in, in the book. Amen. But the book is dealing with Think Like God. Hallelujah. And I wrote this a long time ago, but I really encourage you to get it. We actually, how many, do we have some copies? Like seven? Maybe ten. Ten. So we can get it for $15. And uh, amen. amen. I just want to encourage you on that. Hallelujah. If you haven't read it or you haven't got it, hallelujah, um, it'll help you. Amen. And uh, so we thank goodness we were able to get some of them. The last 35 they have, and we okay. sold like 20 of them last week. And we just, you can't get any more? Um, that's a complicated thing. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Like, we will it's become a mom knows. Well, the Holy Ghost will show us what to do. Yeah. I was dreaming the other night, and I knew there was a clause that any legality. With what's going on, says they cannot settle this in a court, which they already violated the law on the third book when they actually went to that attorney, because according to the contract, it was like on the bottom that says you have to go to Christian, a certain Christian council association, 
So we try to do it where you don't have to go to court. We included that in the contract because I got that from Gary Smalling. Gary Smalling had a deal with it so that way it wouldn't be a legal thing. They would keep it out of the court. The other night I was thinking about this and it came to me and I was like, I remember him telling me that, why I included that bottom paragraph. And I thought I need to go back and look at that. And God has a way of doing everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, amen. Hallelujah. Are you all ready this morning? Amen. 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 I want to go with, have you go with me to Matthew chapter 10. I'm trying to think of a title for this. I'm going to call it the First Church Growth Conference. Amen. I thought, it, thought for a second, I was thinking of something someone thought the other day, and they would read a passage, and I thought, okay, man, it gave me a thought. What was the first time, the first time there ever was a church growth conference in the Bible? Well, we know that Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. And we are his body. Hallelujah. So I thought, when would be the first time you would get an idea of this? And I went all the way to Matthew chapter 10, because I was thinking about what produces growth. And I was thinking, we really need to go to the essence of it and start up with the root. Amen. And I wrote some simple things here because there's some very powerful things. Amen. Uh, when it comes to these principles. I thought, what an interesting, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. Amen. Matthew 10, verse 1. Hallelujah. Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal the sick, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, I know this is not the first principle. I'm going to give you the first principle. Uh, to me, there are certain principles, but to me, this is within the realm of what I would call the first principle. Jesus summoned the disciples and gave them authority. I'm going to put this and I'm going to call it principles. I'm going to put you, I know it sounds strange, but I'll put number one, authority. Authority um, is me to like, I now deputize you a policeman. I now give you what? Authority. So I've been thinking about it and I was thinking about what, what is it? That, that makes something grow, or I was thinking about my car, and I'm going to do that again one day, go over a thing on 20, probably 20-some 20 elements of soul, way, another one called 20-some keys to multiplication. We'll deal with some of these things, but I believe all of this is within the realm of what I call the force of evangelism. Amen? But it's the essence of growth in uh, more than one sense. Amen. If I had to do it that way, I was writing different notes, different times during the week, and thoughts down concerning just the fact that I sat in a, and I was sitting in a conference, and thoughts were coming to me, and I was going, uh, really, to target things, amen, the right kind of way, amen, to maximize the results. Even when Paul was commissioning Timothy, and 2 Timothy 1, he was telling him to stir up the gift. He told him, do the work of an evangelist. Amen. And he was almost like empowering him because, remember, he appointed him. Amen. He was basically, Timothy was over all of Ephesus. And um, you have to understand the commission here. The first thing was you know, he gave them authority. I'm just going to um, look at certain elements. Number one, authority over unclean spirits. And the first thing was over unclean spirits. Amen? The first thing was over unclean spirits. But I'm not going to include that. Well, authority over what? Unclean spirits. But I'm not going to include that. One could have what we call behind authority A, B, C, who's with me? And you could put your unclean spirits who's with me. And you say, what's that got to do with? I need another pain. 
What's that got to do with church growth or the first church growth conference? Amen. The first thing Jesus gave them power over, like you tell the cop, we assign the clock, okay, now your first job may be watching the parking. Maybe it's not going to be out who's with me, dealing with crime. And, you know, they don't start that way. Amen. It might be after a while you're just going to work on speeding tickets. You know what I mean? But the idea is the first thing here that I thought was interesting to notice here, this is Matthew. Jesus is now on the scene. Jesus is the head of the church. Upon this rock, the revelation of who Jesus is, I will build my church and the gates of hell will what? No. The, the first thing he deals with is unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. It's very important to understand that. Because I'm not going to go into the depth of this, but I encourage you to go study unclean spirits. Unclean spirits include a vast variety. Sexually dirty spirits, homosexual spirits, lesbian spirits, ungodly relationships. Who's with me? Um, all kinds of sexual perversions, including unclean spirits. Who's with me? It also includes, um, we uh, had like the other day, I was, um, you know, sometimes we'll have certain people that have come in our house and, and I can smell that they've been involved with internet pornography or something. Who's with me? I can smell. There's unclean spirits working. Now, unclean spirits involve a lot of different things, not just that. Dirty spirits. Some people are not bathing. They're getting lazy. They're coming in. My goodness, they sit in the church. You can't even sit around them. They smell so bad. You want to stand around them and spray fragrance all over them while they're sitting in church. You might not laugh at me, but some of you have seen those people sit there, and you can smell that dirty spirit. Like, almost like they haven't bathed for two weeks or something. And sometimes it's not that they have a bath, they'll tell you, yeah, I bathed that morning. They're just stinking from being around stinking. Hallelujah. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? And then sometimes these unclean spirit people, you know, can act like they're spiritual too. Amen? Because unclean spirits is not just that category. We need to understand what we call unclean spirits. When we deal with spirits, we have something called discerning of spirits. All kinds of unusual spirits, but it moves into that category. Amen? of what we call discerning of spirits. Here comes a Jezebel spirit. You know, the Jezebel spirit. I've had it like, you know, it, it seems like Amanda's been in several situations where it ends up in these homes with these controlling women. And, they, and the way she defines them and the way they act after you've heard the stories for several months is you know it's a Jezebel spirit. And usually the pastor likes that person whether they go to church. And they know how to warm up to authority. Trust me. They understand all that stuff. So, you know, I'm not going to go through and tell you to read books on Jezebel spirits. You can find them. You can read them yourself. Amen. But you have to have discerned spirits. So somebody comes in here and says, yay, yay, yay. Thus says Mother Mary. Amen. And we had that happen as well. Hallelujah. Long ago. And in Branson, I've had yay. I, I think I've seen more variety of dealing with unclean spirits and weird stuff here than I've seen almost anywhere I've traveled. In the world, I've had to deal with more stuff sitting here in this town. I mean, from every kind of weirdness, more variety of weirdness I've discovered here than I've really discovered almost anywhere I've ever been. When, they, when you say that, you know, like more variety of weirdness or weird people, you know, coming here. Or they're coming here to now bring you as the pastor a word from the Lord, and they've never been in the church before, but now. Or they sit in the church one day, and they think next Sunday they're going to preach already. Or they come to the church, I mean, they move fast. Or they come in and they bring you their book on how to correct all the pastors in Branson. Hallelujah. So, and we have gone through all of that. I'm telling you legitimate stories about how they bring you their books to correct you. Hallelujah. Or they send you a prophet to the to the church, which we've had happen as well, and prophesy you outside of Branson. Even assigned by another pastor in Branson to prophesy for you to pack up your bags and leave. Uh, you understand, we've had people come here who are sent by another pastor in town, a prophet, supposedly, and they use the realms of familiarity. And this to me, one case was actually a prophet from South Africa who was instructed by another pastor in town to come and prophesy on the outside, out of town. Amen. So Branson, trust me, you better really get in the Word and know the Word. Because we have the flakes, the bubbles, the pops, the... the the weirdos, the unclean spirit, the witches, the 
intercessors who just think the intercessor called Solomon, you know, I'll never forget Robert Slater and rebuking a lady when we were at the Lightnings of God conference in 2001 in Branson. And we had, she had set up a table and came in and she said, well, I'm part of the intercessory group in Branson. And he said, what do you do? He said, we intercede. He said, have you led anybody to the Lord in the last year? She said, no, 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 sir. I'm the head of the intercession club in Branson. And Robert's turned in and said, you're a fake. She got so mad. I've never seen that lady ever again in Branson. I've never seen her again, ever again. Never. She, she came to church a few times before that, but never saw her ever again after he called her a flake. Hallelujah. I was thinking, that's definitely not church growth strategy right there. Um, amen. So I was thinking, what are these things that Jesus is talking about? He said, you shall have authority over unclean spirits. Cast them out. To heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Amen. So I want you to look at this, and then he goes through and he names his 12. And let me start mentioning some of these. I'm going to say the first one is authority, principles. Amen. Uh, first principle. Um, number two, amen. Number two. Is I want you to go again to Matthew chapter 10. Keep going down. Let's go to verse 5. Verse 5. Are you ready? Matthew 10, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and struck them. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any city of the Samaritans. But rather go, amen, to the lost, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Understand. This was before the great, before the Holy Spirit came, who's with me, and the door was open because, remember the principle here, is God delivers God first. God works with God. The first thing God was sent to when Jesus came, he said, I'm not sent to anybody, Jesus said, I'm not sent to anybody except the lost house of Israel. So the only people Jesus was focused on healing was the Jew. He was a Jew, and he was focused on healing his children. Amen. Amen. Because the bread of deliverance does not belong who's looking to those outside of the family. Amen. The bread of deliverance belongs to the children. Listen very carefully. Okay, to my principles. Because God heals God, God delivers God first. And that was Jesus focused before the Holy Spirit came. And it was going to go beyond God working with God. Who's with me? Right. So from, you could almost say from Genesis to the end of the Gospels, we see the foundation of God working with God. We see its elements in operation after that, but Pentecost causes us to step into overflow. Amen? God is righteous. He delivers the righteous. If God delivers God. All in the Old Testament, everything God does in the Old Testament is based upon how God works with God. How God talks to God. How God hears God. It is when the Cyrenian woman comes along and they said, well, this woman keeps nagging us and nagging us. She's not a Jew. You know what I mean? So they were trying to send her away. Jesus said, it's not fitting to give the bread at the table to the dogs. And when you look that up in Greek, he literally called her a dog. I know people don't like that, but he called her a dog. Amen. And, and she said, but Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So what happened is she tapped into overflow. She was tapping into something that was to come. That means when the Holy Spirit comes and commissions you and you go into Pentecost, now out of your belly, rivers of living water are going to flow. Amen? Amen. So the thing here in this thing is I wrote down number two. No, you'll see, I wrote down here number two. The idea we get from this first church growth conference from Verse 5, verse 6, we get this idea, know who you call, number 2, know who you are called to reach. Amen? To reach. Know who you call to reach. Know who you are called to reach. Amen? Know who you are called to reach. If I had to isolate down and say, okay, here's light of glory, in Hollister, Missouri, then I'm going to say, know who I'm called to reach. Who's Light of Glory called to reach? That Light of Glory is a prototype of an apostolic power base in one sense. That was the original idea 
we have a vision for the local area, and then we have a vision for a prototype for an international. But he first said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll go from Judea, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, Jerusalem, Judea and the uttermost parts of the world. Are you with me? So know who you are called to reach. The first thing, if you don't know who you're called to reach, well, I don't have many friends. Well, then I suggest you make some friends and start off reaching friends. Friends reach friends. Know who you're called to reach. Some people, they try to reach somebody in Egypt, but they can't even get their neighbors saved. Who's with me? While I'm working with this guy on the internet, and I'm trying to save him in China, in the meantime, my neighbors go to hell. Hallelujah. Okay, you with me? That's not going to help us with local church growth. Amen? That doesn't help with local church growth. That's helping with your growth of your international contacts. It will be evangelism. Hallelujah. But knowing who you go to reach... We need to understand principles of the initial church growth. He knew his target audience. He knew his target audience. Jesus knew he was going to reach. Amen? He didn't advertise beyond that. He didn't promote beyond that. He didn't talk beyond that. He kept saying, I'm only there to reach. He knew where he was going. Who's with me? Hallelujah. He knew his audience. He didn't leave Israel. Amen? He didn't start going over to other countries to preach. Nobody help me. Okay. You say, what's he doing? That, that has to be a key. I thought about it. it. has to be a key. Because this is where we get so everywhere. It's, under, it's understandable when I've already traveled around the world. But I'm talking about locally. Know who you called to reach. Amen. Then I want you to go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7. And as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I'll write down here number three. Amen. Number three, and I believe this is the initial key to the first church growth. Amen. You've got to what? The, one of the things is, what is he saying there? And as you go preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who knows what the kingdom of heaven is at hand means? When I do my manual wisdom for signs and wonders, I talk about the fact that when Jesus pointed at demons, I like the message Bible that says, when I point at demons and send demons packing okay. on their way, you know the kingdom has showed up. So every time it says a message when Jesus cast out devils, he said, when he cast out devils, it was the kingdom showing up. So when you see somebody getting healed, you know the kingdom is manifesting, who's with me, through you. Amen. The kingdom is what? I'm right down here. Manifest. Now let me change it. Amen. Do supernatural ministry. Do supernatural ministry. Amen. Just think about it because I'm trying to get the essence here. Number one, you need to know you have authority. Number two, you need to know who you're called to reach. Number three, you need to do supernatural ministry. Do supernatural ministry. You say, what do you mean? You've got to start praying for someone sick. Oh, brother, I'm at the restaurant. I see you've got ankle pain. Can I pray for you? They get healed. My pain's gone. Man, where are you from? Where do you go to church? Well, I go to this place, a holistic called Light of Glory. Man, I need to come over there. Wow. Something is on you. It's a, it's a growth principle. They see supernatural flowing through you. Don't be just always just the minister. We need all. I, I'm convinced. There's an, a mantle in my life and an oil in my life, and I'm convinced that, that, and one of the primary reasons we started Sword Ministries, and we used to have a statement on a banner here called Speaking the Truth in Revival pierced in the innermost beings, and we'd have a statement called demonstrating signs and wonders perfectly in order by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced that every person on the earth can flow in signs and wonders. Amen? Yes. Not just Benny Hinn or Tim Story or certain people. Who's with me? Yes. I'm convinced every person on the earth can have a supernatural, can do supernatural. These signs shall follow them that believe. 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. These signs, I didn't say these signs shall follow the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. No scripture. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Do you believe? Yes. This is part of the regular commission, Matthew 28, Mark chapter 16. The commissions are that you do supernatural ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, let me go a little further. Verse 8. Ready? Verse 9. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for money, belts. Verse 10. Or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy. The worker is worthy of his support. We're not taking away from the fact that the worker is what? Worthy of his support. Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of people when they do something for God are trying to expect to get something. I don't know how many people we've hired in the ministry, and we were always counseled by our leaders. Let them volunteer before for a while. That way you can really see their true attitude. See how they help and work with the church for a while before we ever think about bringing them onto full-time staff. Well, we've learned that mistake by bringing people on without not letting them volunteer long enough. Amen? And seeing exactly where they're at and what their attitude is. So, I wrote in here, another key here is why do you say, or a bag for your journey, or two coats or sandals? Well, what, what does he mean here? Amen? Now, we understand that we have to make sure people are taught to give. Amen? Because when you give, it will be what? Given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Who's with me? But I think we have to also be very careful not to have an overemphasis of preaching on giving. Because before you know it, they're going to run all over town. You see, see that church over there? All they do is want your money. All they do is want your money. You know what the church does? The church just wants your money. Every time you go there, they're going to preach on giving for a while. Because... You go to their church, all they do is want your money. Now, I know some churches like that where people are running around town already, even in Branson, and they'll tell a certain pastor or certain pastor or certain people say, all they want to do is get your money there. Because they always preach on money. Always preach on giving. They're just out to get your money. Hallelujah. Who's with me? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, you have to understand when you're in a fame oriented town, and we have seen it with this town. We have seen it over and over in town. When we had uh, Trilex, and we had the Shorty brother. When we had the the you know the singers, Mark, and the whole that whole Shorty family of Assembly God. When they came into town, they were famous Assembly God singers. And I remember when they took over Trilex, boom! Overnight, well, I can tell you, the church crew went from nothing to like a thousand five hundred people, and it was this family, and they were singing. And they were famous, and then the one pastor started. The other went to leave, another one left, the other one traveled as evangelist, the other one went down, started working over it across town, and the other one was trying to manage the church, and he wasn't as strong by himself, and as time went on, it wasn't as popular. Even though he got a whole theater, and everyone was attracted to the theater instantly, and if he stayed with his whole family, he'd probably still have like 2,000 sitting in his theater every week. Amen? And we have seen that shift in this town by popularity all the time. I can name you one shift after another. Yes. All you have to do is be famous and go get a theater on Sunday morning, and boom, you've got 2,000 people. The town is very much drawn to fame. Understand the spirit behind this town. I'm not talking about driven by fame. I'm talking about you need, we need genuine growth principles, and you can't have it. So one could almost write down here, um, I don't want to say it, but... You've got to know how to deal and see through money carefully. When people come, if they just think it's a money church, how do we expect to grow? So we need to not be materialistic, but let people see a giving spirit. So I'm going to say, amen, number four, not materialistic. Materialistic or whatever. Amen, but a giving spirit, for example, is as people see... That the church is excited about having a giving, who's with me, having a giving spirit. Amen. Now, what I'm trying to say is there has to be, you don't want to be materialistic. Amen. But you're having a giving spirit. Who's with me? That is when people see the excitement like, wow, 
I love the way how happy people are and how excited they are to give at that place. But yet, at another sense that the pastor is not doing an overemphasis like he is money hungry or money greedy. Amen? Who's with me? Some people are always like, we need to have so much money or the church is going to close down. We need so much money we will not pay our bills. Amen. I don't think I've ever done that in this place. Hallelujah. That's one thing I can say. Amen. Because God has always done it. Hallelujah. God has always done it because we trusted Him. Amen. Amen. Then I want you to go a little further. Verse 11. And whatever city or village you inquire with you, stay in the house and leave that city. Verse 12. Amen. Verse 10 and 11. Let me focus on 10 and 11. So, verse 11. Whatever town or village you enter, search for a worthy person there. Stay at the house until you leave. Stay in the house until you leave that city. Yeah. Go with me to Luke 10, 7. I want you to see this one as well. And I want to show you another key here, which I thought was very important when it comes to just practical principles of first growth. Now, um, stay in the house. Eating and drinking what they give you. For the laborers worthy of his wage. Do not keep moving from house to house. Do not keep moving from what? This is Jesus, again, giving the commission to his disciples at this time, but he's saying that. So this is Luke 10, 7. Stay in that house. Eat and drink it, whatever they give you. For the labor is worthy of his wage. Do not keep moving from house to house. Go back with me to Matthew 10, verse 11. Amen. Matthew 10, verse 11, and I'm going to give this to you. I started looking at it, it says, why does he say, don't move, amen, stay at his house? So I thought to myself, why does he say not move? And then what happens is when I began to do some study, I noticed in Israel, they had all a bunch of little houses together, but that was not the case when you go to Israel. I'm sure Melody has been there, and they say, that what I understand is they say when they go to Joppa and go to the place with Peter at his house, when they go to the side of the hill, they see all these little houses, but when they come to Peter's house, his house, was five times bigger than all the other houses. And they were saying, why Jesus went to certain houses? Because in those houses, a crowd could gather. And in those houses, it was a public meeting place because they didn't go to the temple. Who's with me? For the time when Jesus was going around, and when people would have other meetings who was with me and not going to the temple, they had, they had bigger homes in certain areas where actually people would meet at those homes. And so these weren't like homes where it was just a little cubicle or a teeny little house. This was actually a public meeting place. Well, today that's different. Houses have not become public meeting places today. Now we have physical buildings like this, amen, which they didn't have. Who's with me? They didn't have churches. They just had one temple in Jerusalem. Somebody help me. They didn't have 500 tents and 500 churches in Jerusalem. Somebody help me. So the idea of this specific house was a house that was big enough where somebody could actually have an extra room to stay in, other people could stay in the house. It had, according to the way I understand, Peter's house had like five, six, seven, eight rooms, and it had a big room where many people could gather. And it was supposed to be like five, six times bigger than everyone's house there in Joppa. So it wasn't like Peter was some poor guy either. Like Jesus would say sometimes, come to the house to see where I'm staying. That means he could publicly handle other people could stay there as well. Are you with me? Yes, amen. And all that is a matter of research. So when people talk about in the New Testament breaking of bread from house to house. What they meant was when they finally get in the book of Acts and they talk about going from house to house, they're talking about the word for house was different. It was a place where people could gather, a public gathering house. A house where many people could meet in the place. Who's with me? Sometimes 50 people would gather. And to fit 50 people, you have to have a pretty big lounge to fit 50 people in. Who's with me? So these weren't just like just going to somebody's little apartment, hallelujah, and having a Bible study. That is not what the scripture was talking about when they were breaking bread from house to house. They were talking about breaking bread from a public house to a public house. It was a house where many could gather, who's right, because there was no church. So when people get hung over and they're adamant about a house church, who's right, and just having a Bible study in the apartment, they're actually not 100% correct according to the New Testament. Amen? 
And so before you know it, we know, and we've seen this in Branson, multitude of what we call house churches. Amen? We have many of those in town called house churches. I remember me and Taylor running it a couple of while ago, and they were all having their house church because they were so adamant that at their house, all they would do is watch Kenneth Copeland at their house, and they're not going to anybody else's place. And they're right here in Branson, so they, they, they might gather with their 15 people. And then another house church. We know another lady in town has a house church. She's in all this generational deliverance stuff. And they have to meet in her house to cast that devils out of you, fam. And if you leave that little house church group, you might never totally get delivered. Because they're the only ones that have a secret to keeping you delivered. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to give you it and be real honest with you because these are serious things. So I'm going to write down here number five, amen, stability. You say, why stability? Because look at Luke, one more time, look at Luke chapter 10, verse 7, amen. Luke 10, verse 7, hallelujah. Luke 10, verse 7. Amen? Stability. Hallelujah. Do not keep moving from what? House to house. Stability. Stability. Who's it? No quiet. Amen. Matthew chapter 10. Carry on. Verse 14. Matthew 10 verse 14. Hallelujah. Matthew 10 verse 14. Amen. Be stable. Hallelujah. You notice something else? Hold on one second. Let me just go back to Matthew 10. Where was that? Verse 11. Let me just say one thing. Uh, and whenever you enter that building, inquire with, and as you enter the house, give it a greeting. If the house is worthy, you would bless it. Uh, take uh, whatever you receive. Okay. Remember in the other one, it says, eat what was ever said before you. Remember that? Who remembers that? Yes. Remember Luke 10? Yeah. He said, eat what was ever. I went and looked up the eat there. You know what Jesus was talking about there? He was letting them know, guess what? There's coming a time. That you're going to go into Gentiles' houses. And you will not be eating your Jewish food. Yeah. I looked to study on that. When Jesus was saying, eat what he said before you, when you go to somebody else, what he was trying to tell them is, you're going to go into a Gentile's house. And before you know it, you might have to eat some pork and some shrimp. Who's with me? And you might have to eat some food that Jews don't eat. Yeah. And he was trying to tell them, get ready. Because there's coming a time that you're going to go to the Gentiles. And when you do... And you go to those people's home, make sure you eat what's set before you because it's going to be non-Jewish food. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. So I'm not going to go into all the revelation on that, but that's what he was talking about. Basically, amen. he was preparing them that there's coming a time that you're about to eat something. And this is why we end up in the book of Galatians with Paul literally rebuking Peter yes. over not sitting down and eating with the Gentiles. Come on. Yeah. Yes. And he made it and he rebuked him publicly over the food issue. And Jesus was already telling Peter back in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in Luke, to get ready because it's going to happen. And he even sent him a blanket down from heaven right. and said, showed him all these creatures and eat what he said before you. And then he goes to Cornelius' house and says, God told me to show no partiality. Basically, when I get to Cornelius' household, you're going to get saved, full of the Holy Ghost, but I'm also going to eat what you prepare. Right. Amen. And it's not going to be Jewish food. Hallelujah. Yeah. Because you're uncircumcised. Amen. So, I don't know what that's going to be anything, but <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm just praying that you get that, amen? Yes. Um, hallelujah. So, I want, so let, me, let me go. Then verse 14. Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of the house of the city, shake the dust off your feet. I'm going to write down your number six. Amen. Um, Eliminate, number six, amen, eliminate time wasters, amen, I'm going to put something with it, amen, eliminate time wasters, amen, focus on people who are open to the gospel, focus on people who are, who's with me, who are open to the gospel. Don't waste your energy on the people who are not. Amen. Focus on people who are open. Because he says, like, shake your dust off. What's he trying to say? Don't waste your time. 
You stay there long enough, you're going to get dust on your feet. You might walk away angry. Right. <sighs> this gospel doesn't work. They don't get saved. I'm trying to get five people saved today, and it just doesn't work. And <sighs> Who's with me? And of course, next week, who's with me? You're not going to go soul winning. Amen. And next week, you're not going to work on getting any kind of growth to happen in the church anyhow because you're going to lose your that spirit of soul winning. Amen. That attitude, who's with me, of soul winning. You're going to lose that. Amen. So, hallelujah. Let me make sure that we still there. Number seven. Look at Matthew 10. Amen. Look at that. Go with me to verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as what? Doves. Be shrewd as serpent, as innocent as doves. Now, it's not like trying to say, don't be overly suspicious, who's with me, but be shrewd, be shrewd means be wise when dealing with people. Be wise, amen, who's with me? Be wise when dealing with people, amen, who's with me? Be wise when dealing with people. Sometimes people are very rambunctious. They just go in, hallelujah. But you gotta be wise. Amen. When dealing with people. Daniel had an incredible testimony he was sharing with me on his trip. But I went to a place and how he dealt with certain things and why he had more people saved on this last weekend trip that he went on than all the other kids. And a lot of it got to do with wisdom in dealing with people. So he was able to lead more people to the Lord. Amen. Just using the wisdom of God. Amen. It's kind of like the pastor, the, the minister on Friday night mentioned about eliminating the word if. If you'll please bend down. Who's with me? Yeah. It's not like, oh, with me. Daniel was using the statement like when they get ready to go. And they didn't say, can I, can I please ask you a question? Mm. You know what I mean? If you, Daniel was telling me they came to someone and the first person was saying, can I please ask you a question? And then said, well, no, 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 you know what I mean? They thought it was, and sometimes they'll back off and they're really prepared their defense. Who's with me? Mm. And Daniel just went in and said, Daniel just goes and said, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, okay. He didn't say, can I please? He just said, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. And then he asked the question. Before you know it, he's working his way in there, preaching to them and getting them saved. You know what I mean? That's called being shrewd. Shrewd. Not, can I please ask you a question? That's it. I'm going to ask you a question. That's called being shrewd. Who's with me? Amen. So he says, I am sending out like sheep in the midst of the wilderness, but be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Hallelujah. You need to apply that when it comes to soul winning. Amen. To be shrewd. One could say be wise, but you know, you could be, we could put the word shrewd, yeah. Amen. Shrewd. Who's with me? When dealing with people. Hallelujah. So be shrewd, amen, when dealing with people. Number, go with me to verse 17. Look at this. Beware of men, for when they hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogue, amen. So verse 17, what does it mean? Be prepared for resistance. Be prepared for resistance. Let me say that. Number eight, amen. Be prepared for Who's with me? For resistance. I don't want to hear anything about that. I don't believe in that Jesus stuff. Blah, 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 blah. Who's with me? Yeah. Amen. Well, we heard that. I just had someone the other day, you know, like dealing with someone who had come here before. And they were accusing me just the other day of being a cult leader. But, you know, once they did that, like, their numbers eliminated, gone, goodbye, blocked out history. You know, go somewhere else because I'm a cult leader. Amen. <laughs> Be prepared for resistance. Amen. Amen. Be prepared, who's with me, for resistance. People are going to not like what you have to say sometimes. They're going to come against you. Amen. Uh, verb, look at this. Number Matthew chapter 10. Carry on. Look at this. But when they hand you over, go with me down to verse 21. Verse 21. Brother will betray brother and father and child will raise against parents. Amen. Against parents, causing them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. 
You'll be what? Hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be what? Saved. Endure to the end who will be what? Saved. Keep going. And whatever persecution is said in fleeing another, look at verse 24. A disciple is not at verse 25. It is not enough for the disciple that he become like the teacher and a slave like his master. But if they have called the head of the house be eligible, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Amen. Don't take criticism personally. Don't take criticism personally. You know somebody's going to say, well, I don't I, You know, it's terrible how the Christians say, you didn't do it right. Blah, 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 blah. Amen. What I'm saying is you've got to know how to deal, or let me say it, know how to deal with criticism. Amen? Who's with me? Know how to deal with criticism. Deal with criticism, amen? I'm telling you, it's not going to help you, amen? That's not how you spell it anyhow, amen? C-I-S-M, amen? Criticism, amen? Know how to deal with criticism. You know, and, and it's terrible because it doesn't come from, from the Christians. It sometimes comes from your own friends. Amen? And it comes from, so you've got to know how to deal with that. Hallelujah. Matthew 10, verse 26. Go there for me. Matthew 10, 26. Amen? Matthew 10, 26. Let me try to go real quick here. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be real or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetop. Preach whether it is right or not. Preach whether it's politically correct or not. Just preach. Amen. Who's with me? Preach. Yes. Preach. Preach. I'm just going to put down your number 10. Preach. I mean, you say, how is that a principle to church growth? People are like, well, what did you learn? Well, we got a lot of glory, but we didn't learn anything. Huh? You know what I mean? Hello, hello? It says, what do you hear in the dark announce on the housetop? One of the principles to church growth is you have to go say to somebody else what you learned. And you should have heard it. I love the way Papa Don keeps talking to people over at the, at the wise. Like, well, you know, my pastor was preaching on this, or, man, that was with me. And they're like, so I had another day that day. Papa Don told me you were ministering on this. Okay. That's good. Because that tells me they're actually hearing something about our message. Like, hey, you know, the pastor's actually saying something over there. You know, some good things that can actually help you. You know what I mean? Wow, you know what I mean? How long does that mean? Preach. You've got to preach. Hallelujah. Amen. Matthew 10, 37. Anyone, Matthew 10, 37. Anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Who loves my loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Amen. I learned what this one is, and my son Kelvin learned this very carefully. It's not to show partiality. You don't show partiality. You don't show favoritism. Some people like to come to the church and say, "I'm the favorite. I want to be second in command." Who's with me? And and my wife has known I've never put the children who's with me above recognizing other people's gifts and abilities. If they have more gift and ability. They were children, who's with me? They would be in that position. Amen? And what happens is, you say, how is that? Why is that important? Because what happens is, with some situations, some people think, oh no, he's just favoring his son instead of me. Not the case. My son actually stepped into the plate. Yes. He actually drove 16 hours, and I watched him even come into Maine, listening to 16 hours of my teaching on increase of anointing. By the time he got to Maine, people were dropping into the power of God. I've watched him listening to hundreds of my teachings. Other people say, well, why do you pick your son? Now, he's actually listened to a hundred times more of my teaching than you have. He actually has more of the anointing that he's got from me. And it's not that he got it any different than anybody else. He got it because he's actually read all my books. He went through all my books. He answered all the questions. He went through the schools. He went through several of my schools. He's edited my schools. He's listened to hundreds and hundreds of my messages. He earned. He, he's earning yes. his position. Yes. Yeah. He's earning the right, not just to be, he's not, not as a son to make him any different. He's earning the right to be a spiritual son. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Understand? Yeah. That makes it different. Because some people said, this is another thing to principles ago, because some people think you show favoritism more than somebody else. 
Amen. So I'm going to say maybe no favoritism because something like that doesn't help a church grow. No favorite, whatever it is, amen. However you want to say it, amen. Say, so what's that got to do with growth? It does. Amen. It means doing things, yeah. What? Love righteousness. Yeah. So I'm not trying to give you something complicated. I'm just trying to give you something very simple. Amen. Simple. Hallelujah. Amen. And that is so powerful. And so I believe those are just some of the things that are just real simple things to what we're talking about. Amen. Let me, I want to do something in one second because I want to share with you one more thing. Amen. Hallelujah. And um, I want to do one more thing that... Um, Hallelujah. I want to do one more thing here. Um, and that is this. I wrote down a couple other thoughts as well that I wanted to include with just what we're saying. I believe you're getting it. Number one, authority. I just went, but I wrote down a couple other thoughts. And I thought I'm going to just add these with this. Maybe as a separate, amen, element. Hallelujah. I think I have a better one for the stage. The separate element. And that is within this, I think one of the things that we do not forget, I wrote down just simple things this morning. I wrote down this morning, I was trying to think, how do we get through certain things concerning growth? Amen? Because I've been thinking about this. Not to do, it's like, I even watched another video, which I understand people like, people need to be assigned. So there is some certain things I'd like to rearrange as we go along over, you know, coming up. Because I'm seeing certain things that we need to do. Amen. It's not that there's just the anointing or the power is there. But it's very important that we understand our purpose. You've all seen that, what we call just different statements like purpose. Amen. You understand? What is the purpose of us gathering? What's the purpose of a body? The other thing is, I thought some other things is that keep things. These are just things I was thinking the Lord will show me that keep things alive. Is testimony. Amen. A testimony. Daniel has a powerful testimony. Maybe I should have him just come and share some of it. But a testimony shows you somebody was doing something. Who's with me? Everyone, we should actually get somebody every Sunday morning to at least have one or two people every week share a testimony. You know, I was out soul winning. I was out witnessing. Who's with me? Hallelujah. And I thought years ago, I used to do a thing where we did, and that is, I did. I wrote this down again. I was reminded of this. Schedule. Uh, was it schedule? Amen. Soul winning. And Calvin used to take people out every week. Schedule soul winning. Yeah. I found out if you don't schedule soul winning, you are not going to go soul winning. Okay. Schedule soul winning. These were just things coming to me as I was sitting. I went and wrote them down yesterday and this morning. I thought of something else. When we were in a certain place and, you know, Smith Wigglesworth used to say this statement all the time when he would finish preaching. Go tell someone about Jesus this week. I thought, why would Smith Wigglesworth say that? I wrote that one. I thought, interesting statement. Slip Wheels would say, go tell who's with me about Jesus this week. Go tell someone about Jesus this week. Go tell someone about Jesus this week. I know we all work in, we can all do our own thing. But go tell someone about Jesus. Amen. Then the other thing the Lord came to me, or came to me, is that this was a strange one that came to me. I was thinking of my friend in Paducah, my friend Richard. I thought, he told me, he said, I've had more people, visitors come to my church from something strange. And I thought, what was making people that would come to his church? It was a stack of CDs he had at the side of the church. Every time he'd preach a message on Sunday morning, he'd go make 15, 20 copies of it and put it on a table. 
Many money in this church to take one to give to someone they would like to invite to the church. He said, now, don't just take it. Make sure you take a CD. It's not for you. The CD is for you to give to somebody to let them hear what the pastor preached. And it was fresh. Yeah. And he used the word, and then that word hit me yesterday. It was like, I think, what did Richard say? Richard said, it was fresh bait. I thought. Then he was telling tell me why the church, that new people have been coming to the church. And the other day we shared how new people were coming to church through those CDs. He'd give the CD, they'd go hand it to someone, someone listened to it and said, yeah, I'll come back. They actually listened to the CD before they ever came to church. And I thought, I wrote down, number five, provide bait. <laughs> provide bait. I don't know what kind of bait, but the idea came, we need bait. What? Can you spell bait? What is that wrong? -A -I -T. What? B-A-I-T. B-A-I-T. Okay. Bait. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Provide bait. Now, you, you have some bait from the word that you receive. Who's with me? Yeah. But I think that we might have to come up with something, whether it's something that you can tangibly have. Amen. Now, that's... We got a problem to solve, whatever it is, but we need something for you to tangibly to have so that when you go fishing, yes. with me, we made some cal cards for Calvin, which was a card you would give to people, but we're going to have to come up with a bait plan. Amen. But I was thinking of these things, because I was thinking about what is making these people grow. And I'm just trying to give you some elements because we need to have these things purpose, testimony, schedule soul winning. Go tell some people about Jesus this week. I put schedule so many differently because some people have to schedule it. <laughs> Amen. And provide bait. Amen. Come here, Daniel, one second. I want you to hear this because a key to testimony, a testimony is good. I want him to share how he went to evangelism thing, an outreach. Huh? And I want you just to share a little bit what you shared with me happened. How you got people saved. Come, come share your testimony. Amen. They, they need to hear that because it's important that just tell what happened and then how you went to the mall. Well, we went to this big youth conference thing called Dare to Share and called it Fearless. What? And it to what? Dare to Share. Make sure you hold the mic up. I am. <laughs> it's called Dare to Share, and the theme of this youth conference that weekend was fearless. And what they meant by that was to, they were trying to encourage kids to not be afraid, and they went and talked to people. And the way they were explaining it was a lot different than the way Calvin and a lot of other people that I'm usually with do it. And I was like, um, okay, well, and they gave me the three youngest boys out of that entire out of our entire group of training, which made me feel really funny because I was like, oh, um, how come I got stuck with the youngest kids? I mean, but I kinda I'm kinda glad I was with them because out of I mean, a lot of the older kids don't really seem to care as much about wanting to share the gospel and the only reason why they actually did it was because Miss Gregory kinda bribed them. They were like she said, you could at least talk to one person and try and get them safe, then we'll go to the zoo tomorrow and I was like Wow, that's a really stupid goal. It's only one person. <laughs> but, I mean, they all, every single kid tried at least. I mean, they all did something. Some of them actually got people saved, so I was like, wow, that's surprising. Because all, most of these kids don't even want to talk to them about God on a regular basis at all. Like, they don't even want to talk about God anyways when they go to Christian school. So, to hear the fact that they got at least more than one person saved surprised me. I was like, well, okay, awesome. <laughs> But I was glad to have the three boys out of it because they actually had passion to want to go and talk to people about God. But the only mistake that they kept doing was instead of, you know, talking to them like they're trying to actually have a conversation, they kept asking them questions. They weren't telling them what was the truth or saying stuff. They were like, can I do that? You know, or, I mean, after the first person, I mean, when we walked up with the first person, we actually got... We, I mean, that person did get saved. I was happy because they let me, I mean, they did most of the talking, but they let me actually talk to the guy into praying with us. So 
because they weren't exactly getting that player with us at first. When we were at when we were inside the AT&T store, and when I got him, I talked to him a little bit more, and then we got him to pray with us on like we got all five of us got on our knees, and we prayed with him to accept Christ as the Savior, and it was really cool because we were in while we were in that store, this woman walks in and tries to tell and tries to ask him like is like excuse me sir I need some help and the guy stops her and says ma'am. I'm with these boys. I'm gonna finish talking to these boys first, and then I'll help you. And the girl was like, "Okay." And then, um, she kind of she was about to walk out the store. <laughs> so I mean, I was glad we got that person to say it, but I had to correct the boys and place three boys to tell them when you walk up to someone, you can't say, "I'm gonna ask you." But can I ask you a question? You know what I mean? Or sorry, I said I'm, but that's what you're supposed to say. I'm for that. I mean, they walk. We walked to people. And they were saying, "Can I?" And every time they ask that question, I'm like, guys, don't, don't say that. And so, I mean, because when, uh, after I told them that, they decided to try what they thought, like, they decided to try on a Muslim. Didn't very, didn't like them well, with them at least. But <laughs> with them, I mean, I had to kind of put in, at, like, the first several, like, first minute they started talking to them, I had to put in before that so that they wouldn't start, like, starting to say stuff they didn't really understand. Cause they, I mean, there there was two sixth graders and one seventh grader, so I mean, I'm a junior. That's a four year difference, four year difference in grade wise, and I'm a lot older than them. And for me to try, I mean, I had to help them to kind of guide them because, I mean, first off, I had to make sure none of them got in trouble or got hurt because one of the kids I had, I mean, two of the people that are with us who were the the one guy driving the bus, his son was with me. And he was a sixth grader, and the girl in charge of all of us who brought us and told us about the dairy sheriff thing. I had her son too, and she was telling me, Dan, you gotta, I don't want anything happening to him, you know, I better help him, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'll help them. I mean, if they need help, I'll help them. I mean, because I wasn't gonna like just, I wanted them to experience what it was like, because, you know, everyone in that entire school knows I've gone out so many, several times with my older brother, so they know I have a pretty good amount of experience with Calvin. And so I would, every, I would just help them. I mean, if they needed help, I'd help them. I just kind of, I was just there to really help. But And one of the times they were talking to um, this one person, this girl was going, Kendra, and three other girls asked me to come help them with this guy. And I didn't really talk with her, I kind of just waited. But after they left and we all left, I felt obligated by the Holy Spirit to just kind of talked to him some further because they didn't really, I mean, they planted the seed, but I didn't feel like it was there, you know what I mean? I felt like there was just something missing. The guy was sort of thinking about it, and I knew he wasn't going to actually really commit, probably, because the first thing he told them when they went and asked him before I was there, if they sh he said, what evidence do you have that even exists anyways? I mean, he wasn't looking, he didn't really believe in really anything, but he was pretty much telling them they weren't exactly they didn't, they didn't really know any scientific evidence on how to prove God was real or that Jesus is real and they weren't exactly using scripture to help back it up either they weren't doing such a great job and I was like Ugh. I was like <laughs> <laughs> um, and I kind of waited for everyone to leave that person so that I could have a one on one so that I wouldn't be bothered by any other kid trying to butt in and say something. So I didn't feel like being interrupted. I was like, okay, they said they're, they they like they're sure anyway. what, they, what they're saying. You know, they're so I'm going to let them, we're going to walk to someone else who's not that far away. So they went to stop the store clerk. And it was another Muslim. So I was like, hey, you guys can have your fun with that. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and talked to the guy. And while I was talking to the guy, you know, I was asking him, um, so are you thinking about actually... Cause they, like the, this book that they gave you at the there to share thing was like kind of explaining, um, like with my life, it was just explaining the beginning of the Bible and how life came, came about, and everything, who Jesus was, and everything. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like a full, detailed, you know, deep into the word, kind of explaining how Jesus who Jesus was and everything. So I was like, ah, I mean, the book isn't such a great help. I mean, it's like a starting point, but I could tell you wasn't really like, interested in reading it. And I mean, I, I had to talk to him for I talked to him for about five minutes because I was actually I could have talked to him a lot longer, but because the entire school was got to leave the mall, I couldn't really stay. I didn't feel like getting ditched, and every other kid kept like 
telling me to hurry up, you know, like, you guys can shut up, I'm doing something. So I had to keep them from bothering me, and then I told them, okay, why don't you go to Miss Harris and tell her, give me at least nine minutes. And they're like, nine minutes? I'm like, yes, nine minutes. And they were like, why? I was like, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove this guy that God's real. And even though, <laughs> even though that nine minutes, the guy kept arguing with, the guy wasn't well, arguing me technically, but he kept asking me tons of questions, and I had to kind of had to, you know, go slowly and not go like I couldn't say something that he didn't understand. You know what I mean? I had to talk. I had to talk to him. To I had to explain him certain scriptures and what they were and how that how those scriptures actually gave proof. And I also had to give him scientific evidence, but I didn't really have much enough time to really go deeper into proving to him that it was real. But I told him. If I had at least five more minutes of you to explain and prove to you that everything I'm trying to talk to you right now is real, would you believe me? And he said, well, if you actually had the time to do it, then yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to give you this. I'm going I'm to tell you to do this, okay? Look at, start looking into the Word and start reading the Bible daily. And he said, why? I was like, dude, I promise you, you're going to get a revelation. And something's going to happen and you're going to start wanting to get really deep into the word and everything you're going to start seeing that everything in that word is scientifically proven because he was like really I'm like I'm, I'm absolutely sure like I know for a fact that everything you read in that bible is can most all of it I almost said most that's not good all of it <laughs> <laughs> all of it can be proven and I was like Okay, I'll, I'll think about it. And I asked him if I could pray with him, but he didn't really want to pray with him. Because I know I didn't, I couldn't get him to really fully believe that Jesus was real. I mean, even though I tried as hard as I could, I was glad I at least got something. I was able to really dig deeper into his heart and what he believed and what he thought about what the Bible was and everything. And I was glad I at least was able to be there to you know, help him. But yeah, it was just really difficult to talk to that person and see that he didn't want to listen. He didn't, I feel like he didn't want to listen to listening, just that he didn't want to really think about it at first, you know what I mean? I mean, I was like, so I, I had to keep just talking to him and tell him that what I'm saying is true, you know what I mean? Like, I'm speaking the truth. I even explained to him, I was like, what, you know what the one difference between me and every other Christian is like what? I was like, I'm not religious. <laughs> like I was like, what's that supposed to mean? I was like, have you ever been talking? I was like, I said, well, has anyone else, any other Christian ever talked to you about God? Like, actually, yeah, plenty. Like I've had at least three or four other Christians. Like, and what were they? Like, well, one of them was Baptist. Okay. Um, and then he's like, another one was uh, Lutheran. I was like, well, yeah, okay, that's nice. And then he's like, and I also had this guy. Can't remember. I don't know. What, I don't know what. It was, but it was this other form of Christianity or whatever, I guess. And they were trying to, yeah, and I was like, oh, and what did they say? Well, they were trying to convince me about this and that, and they didn't really seem to know what they were talking about, and I was like, oh, I see. I was like, so they didn't know they were talking about, like, no. And I was like, well, that's because they don't fully believe in everything the Lord says. And that, I, mean, I mean, one thing that we do is speak in tongues, and some of those other religions don't even believe in speaking in tongues. So how are they supposed to fully understand the scripture when they don't believe in that one small thing? <laughs> and the guy even asked me what tongues was, and I actually, I mean, I, I mean, he asked me that after I was about to leave, and I was like, oh shoot! <laughs> I was like, man, if I, I, could, I mean, I gotta go, and I had to leave and everything. And I was like, man, this stinks. I can't really explain this guy his questions he's asking me. I don't have, I mean, I, I mean, I added time. I added further time I mean, to doing this, talking to this guy. I almost got in trouble when I got there. I was like, hey, I mean, <laughs> I didn't, I was this sure what to do. So how but, many people? Tell them oh, how yeah. to save. We, out of, with the three boys that I was with, we set a goal to get at least um, five people saved. Not five people to talk to and try to get them saved. Our goal was to get five people saved, not just talk to people. Like, their, everyone else's goal was at least talk to someone and try to get them saved. Our goal was to get them saved. <laughs> so, we got seven, not five. Hallelujah. So, I was glad we 
went half circle. And I was with three kids who didn't even know what they were talking about. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, they, they tried as best as they could to do it, and I kind of had to butt in at that last second to really get them to, to think about it and pray with us. I mean, we had two people get on their knees with us, and get and we had two people actually get on their knees in the middle of a bunch of people and pray with us to get saved. And then we got one person in the AT&T store, and we got another person who was, uh, who. His mother was actually unconscious in the bathroom. And we talked to him about God and told him that everything's going to be okay and everything. Jesus will help you. And we were talking about how, like, we started talking to him and everything. And we were able to get that person safe too. And we got him to pray with us on the bench by the bathroom. Because there was, like, this little bench waiting near you by the bathroom and the mall. So I was like, we were sitting there and I was talking to this kid. And I was able to get him saved. And I was glad because he was freaking out. He was having, you know, all, like, uh, like, he was having all these tears and he wasn't sure what was happening. His mother was just sitting there unconscious in the bathroom. And I even asked the police if I could go in there. And, I mean, even though it was the woman's restroom, but there were a bunch of cops in there. So I, and I was trying to ask them if it I could go in there and pray. And they were like, no, 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 we don't want that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they were just <laughs> freaking out about all this other stuff, telling me they didn't want me in there. And I was like, okay, whatever. But they at least I got their trial safe. <laughs> 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 I mean, I was talking to this kid right in front of the cops, and they didn't care I was talking to him, but they told me I had to. After I got, after I was talking to him for like five, ten minutes, they were talking, okay, I think you talked to him enough. I was like, no, I haven't. Like, I'm not done yet. And they're like, what's that supposed to mean? I was like, you guys can leave me alone. I was like, this is none of your business. If you don't want to talk to God, I mean, then I'm not going to talk to you either. But you're going to avoid me, because I, I even tried to get one of the cops who was talking to the kid to try to stop me from talking to him. I was like, you're not going to stop me from talking to this kid. I was like, I'm going to get him saved, and if you'd like to get saved too, you can talk to me also, but if you don't want to get saved, then you can leave. He was trying to stop me from coming. Oh, 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 I mean, those kids only got about two people each, probably saved. I'm not even sure if they were saved. They said they did, but I don't even think that's... I mean, I'm not sure. I wasn't with them, so I'm not exactly sure they actually got the person saved or not. But some of the stories they were saying afterwards didn't sound like they actually got the person saved. So I was like, okay, you guys talk to people. You didn't actually get them saved. But, I mean, I was just glad that at least the school was getting active somehow with going. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't even want to talk to Oh God, and they're going through Christian school. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but that's what we want to do. I think one of the keys, you see, one of the keys here is like we're saying: not you got to understand your authority, know who you're called to reach, do supernatural ministry. We're not being a terrorist. Have a giving spirit. Have stability. Eliminate time waiters. Focus on people who are open the gospel. Amen. Be shrewd at dealing with people. Amen. Be prepared for resistance. Know how to deal with criticism. He was prepared for resistance. Give me the, the tops. Uh, <laughs> preach. 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 No favoritism. Amen. So if you need some things, the purpose, testimony, schedule sorting, go tell us more about Jesus. Amen. And provide bait, hallelujah. And that was just something that came to me yesterday, provide bait. You know, the Lord says, when you go fishing, you also need bait. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that you have from the resource you received, amen. But Jesus, I think the story is so important, because the first thing it said in Matthew 10, verse 1, Jesus, somebody's his 12 disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits, amen, hallelujah. Gave them authority. You have authority. To tread upon serpents, scorpions, over all the works of the devil. You have authority. Amen. Be bold. Hallelujah. Amen. Be strong. We need, we, we really can do it. We can do this. Hallelujah. I understand location, where we have location, is something we're going and we're believing God. We are believing God. We will. We will. We will be believing God for the, everything here to be, come to a summation, for everything here to be sold. Amen. For us to move into bigger things. And it's going to be more than that. We're going to have 
more what's going to happen is, is we have favor in many places we believe for many different things to happen hallelujah amen and you're part of that so i just wanted to do this as the initial beginning of this amen, amen. and i just felt like calling it the first church growth conference amen so i hope <laughs> that helped you amen Amen. Don't forget, Mom's pulling out the AMP brochure. That is May the 29th and 30th. And uh, KC Christed's going out there. Wayne's going out there. Yeah, Christed. We're going to have a bunch of us go out there. We'll be in Spartanburg for several days. If you want to drive there and you've got the gas and the fuel, the money, and you'd like to drive out there and back, that's fine. You can come and be with us for several days. Um, and we'll be ministering there. And we do soul winning in the park. This is an incredible evangelistic outreach for that city. Amen. So I want to encourage you on that. Hallelujah. And it's a powerful thing. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we just love you this morning. I thank you, Father, for every person that's been listening, every person hearing the words, your Lord. We speak over them. We speak the glory of God. We speak the blessings of God. I thank you for the spirit of soul winning. I thank you, Father, that you're going to lead them this week. I decree over you, you have authority. Lord, I pray that verse again in Acts 4.29, grant unto your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word. Stretch forth your hand to heal that mighty signs and wonders will be wrought through the name of the holy servant Jesus. And the place that they were assembled together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, not just on the like Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. And began to speak with boldness the word of God. I ask you, Father, for a fresh filling, for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, for a fresh empowering, Lord, that they'll be able to preach the gospel with boldness. There'll be a light in the midst of darkness. Lord, that what they hear, your Lord, they will shout it on the rooftop. He said, What you hear in the secret place in darkness means there in the quiet place in the house, that you will shout it on the rooftop. So I speak a spirit of boldness on you a spirit of multiplication, a spirit of increase. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I decree it over you in the name of Jesus Christ. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hallelujah. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Father, I decree this. I decree this. I decree it, Lord. I thank you, Lord, this week, people will be saved. This week, people will be healed. I decree it. I decree it, Lord. I decree it. This week, I declare, Lord, I thank you, Father, that you direct.